Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome, Union Point Church. Um, if you're visiting or if it's your first time, welcome to the gathering of our family. Um, kudos to everybody who showed up on a holiday weekend. You're going to heaven first. <laughs> We're happy to see you. Um, if you could take a moment, uh, we do have some connect cards in front of you in the backs of the seats. You can take those over to the tent if you're visiting. Um, but Union Point Church, we are a family of local churches on mission to lift Jesus and others in Eastern North Carolina. If you feel led to give to that mission, we have two black boxes on either side of the doors on your way out. You can drop off some money there. We have unionpointchurch.com where you can give online. Or we have our apps. We have our main app, which is our content. Um, this is where you can consume anything. And then we have our church center app. This is for connection. If you want to get involved, if you want to sign up for things, including community groups, Bible studies, all that fun stuff. We have a great event calendar up there as well. So really utilize these apps because we're not doing announcements in the traditional form anymore. So um, also, if you want to get announcements, you'll need a profile in that church center app. Um, and you can always, again, when you take those connect cards to the tent, someone can help you out with that and we'll get you all signed up so you can get your announcements directly to your phone. Okay? All right, let's worship. Father, we thank you um, for this day. We thank you for the sacrifices of men and women who have made it possible for us to live in this country in this way. And Lord, we pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones um, serving in our military. And I pray as we are cooking out, grilling out, going to the beach, that we take some time to remember those sacrifices. Father, I pray as we uh, worship this morning that you just fill us up with your spirit and send us out to do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all ready to wake up? Okay, two people. Let's stand up. <laughs> oh, we're ready to worship this morning. We hope you guys are too. We're going to have some fun to begin with. Are you ready? Yep. Three, four. Flames in your eyes, you got wonder working power pouring out of your side. Chip the tomb all the way through the grave was at the inside. Ain't no other pull the greatest miracle of all time. You got power, demons cower when they hear your name call. You got power that still towers, make the lion look small. You got power to devour any kind of pharaoh. Even your tongue is a sword, kind of the score, you are the Lord. No one would never leave. Now it's reality. 
not way back. It's 31 well, years. <laughs> 31 years. I'm nostalgic. <laughs> I'll tell you a little story about this song, a quick story. I actually encountered this song on a Saturday. I received it in the mail. Back then, that was the only way you got music. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and I heard it, and I went, oh, I love this, because it declares what we're supposed to do. So I go bebopping into the praise team the next Sunday morning, the next day. This is where Lene gets it. I was going to say, see where I can get it from. Yeah. And I said, hey, we're doing this song today. And we learned it. And we came in the congregation just like y'all. And we sang it. And we sang it. And we sang it. We sang it 45 minutes. Now, we're not going to do that right now. <laughs> He's scared. <laughs> no. But the Spirit of the Lord moved in such a way that we just, in and out, wove in and out the, the word and prayer and praise all around one song. Uh, you can't plan that. But you can choose to go with it when it comes.
Oh, no, that's all right. That's all right. Just dancing around the stage over here. It's good. Hey, Jason, hand me that stool right there, brother. Yeah. I may sit on it. I may stand on it. I may not. I tell you. Shout to the Lord. How many of y'all did that take you back a few years? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Oh, y'all had to forgive me. I'm sort of like in between stages with glasses. Are you ever like that? Where you're in between stages? And uh, even to the point that sometimes I go, woo, if I'm wearing them. But I have to have them to see them. So anyway, hey, I'm Dale. And so I'm the old guy, as Linnaeus pointed out. But the good news is I'm Lene's dad. Is that not great? Okay. And I'm also Kelsey's dad sitting right there. And uh, then we've got two more. And then a slew of grandkids. And so uh, it's just so good to be here with you today. And I'm part of the teaching team here. And uh, do literally whatever Lene tells me to do. And so she's lived her whole life for this opportunity. And so it's good. And so today, I, I am just thrilled, and I am excited to uh, bring the Word of God. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you some things at the very beginning, and then we're going to read the Word of God, and then we're going to wrap it up. What do you think? Is that, is, that, is that good? Yeah. And Because we are in the Gospel of Mark, and has this not been a blessing uh, to this time? I mean, it's been wild. And so I really, really recommend that you go back and uh, reread through Mark. And just rethink it, restudy it, okay, re-examine it uh, as you're going along because God's going to keep revealing more and more and more things to you. Uh, in a couple of weeks, as a matter of fact, I've already got part of it already, already up, we've got an entire Mark podcast that you can go back and uh, listen to things. And it's in 10-minute bites. Most of us can take anything in 10 minutes, okay? So just in 10-minute bites. And then actually some of the stuff we're going to be covering today uh, there's some, a podcast that deals with that. There's one particular podcast with one subject matter we'll look at very briefly today. There's 95 episodes. So do you think we get into it a little more? Yeah, we dig into it a little more right there. And so it's actually uh, very, very exciting. And we are in Mark 13 today. We looked at the first part of Mark 13 last week. And now we're going to look at the balance of it. And Mark 13 is one of those passages that everybody goes, oh, over. Because, as Aaron pointed out last week, it's part of what we call the Olivet Discourse. And we use these terms uh, all the time. And that's great because discourse means we're just talking. And he's talking on the Mount of Olives. Okay, so I know what people mean when they say that. But the Lord gives us a lot of information here. And it's in Matthew 24, and it's in Mark 13, and it's in Luke 21. And it relates to the end times. And the second I say end times, some people get really excited. Some people get really nervous. I'm surprised at how many people get scared, get frightened. I'll pick on my nene over that. I think, Lene, you told me that you used to get frightened over this when we would talk about it, and uh, which is never the intent, but will the enemy try to do that with us? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, here's what I want to do today because there's so much information and there's even more misinformation related to this. So let me just tell you what to do, okay? We spend way too much time trying to figure out and trying to know things that the Lord hasn't revealed. If the Lord hasn't revealed it, what does that tell us? Go all Bobby McFerrin on it. Don't worry. Be happy. Okay? Don't worry about it. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in a minute where Jesus says, hey, I don't know. Even the angels don't know. And Jesus was totally cool with not knowing. But we seem to think that we have to know. And there's a lot of pride and arrogance and hubris in that. There's also a lot of books to be sold with that. I mean, there really, really are. So what I'm going to encourage us to do is that not only not to spend any time on things that haven't been revealed, if it hasn't been revealed, then do it. but we need to spend more time on the things that have been revealed. Okay? Spend more time on the things that have been revealed. And for the most part, we don't know what has been revealed. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're just going to look at what Jesus said. Is that not a great source? 
Just look at what Jesus said. And don't be enamored by all the stuff that you've heard. I mean, I know I'm the chief of sinners with this. I've heard so many things because we'll throw out titles, we'll throw out personalities. We'll say, uh, you know, Dr. Hesitation says this, Reverend Knows It All says this, you know. And we want to quote all these people. And I can sit there, I guarantee you, when I say something about something, they'll go, well, Dr. So-and-so says this. I know. But what saith the word of God? You know? Well, they think this. That's great. People, if people come to me and say, what do you think about this? If I know you really well, I'm going to say it doesn't matter what I think. If I don't know you, I'll be nice. Okay? But it doesn't matter what I think. What does the Word of God say? So I want you to get two concepts right here and keep this in the forefront of your mind. We're going to have it on the slide right here. And it's the thing of the day of the Lord and the great tribulation. You've probably heard of great tribulation before. Know this. Jesus coined the phrase in Matthew 24. We'll see it in a minute. Jesus was the one that gave that the name. So do I feel good in using that term? Well, sure, but here is where the problem arises. You have the day of the Lord, which is the wrath of God. The wrath of who? God. Upon Satan and upon his minions and upon unbelievers. That is the day of the Lord. You see it all the way through the scripture. In the Old Testament, over and over and over. The day of the Lord, in that day, in that day, in that day. That's the day of the Lord. We have been promised and we've been told that as believers will be spared that. Everybody go, yay. That's Revelation 3.10. Okay, We'll be spared that. We're not going to experience the day of the Lord. The great tribulation, on the other hand, is the wrath of Satan. And it's the wrath of Satan upon Israel and unbelievers. You see this in Revelation 12. Now what happens is, uh, and we're told that we will experience that. Yeah, don't you love hearing that? Jesus told his disciples, and he tells us that we will experience things. We'll have trials. We'll have tribulations. We'll have persecutions. He promised that to us. Again, we all go, yay. We are told that we will experience this. Now, immediately, if you have some background in this, all your mind's going, da 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 So let me tell you, at the very end, I'm going to recap everything and just tell you. One of the things I'm going to tell you is this. Deal with the cognitive dissonance right now. Okay, Deal with learning the truth and then bringing what you think you knew and what you think you know up to the truth and see what the truth reveals. Deal with it now. Don't wait until stuff hits the fan. Determine ahead of time. Luke 21 actually says that. Determine in advance. Okay, Determine some things. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick up Mark 13, but we're going to do it in Matthew 24. (laughs) Lovely, okay? The Matthew 24 account, I'm just going to read through what Aaron covered last week in uh, Mark, and this is Matthew's account. So, what's going on? Jesus has just come out of the temple. Now, Mark talks about uh, him pointing at the woman, you know, who had given some money. Matthew, chapter 21, 22, 23, but particularly Matthew 23, Matthew 23, Jesus deals with what's happening. And that's where um, uh, Jesus talks with the scribes and Pharisees and says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, you hypocrites. He says it, I want to say, seven times, maybe eight times. It is a really, really, really intense moment. I mean, intense. And he says, You're not going to see me again until you see, say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he cries over Jerusalem. He comes out of the temple. And we have this in Matthew 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, the disciples were doing exactly what we do. They were doing exactly what you do with a friend, with a coworker, at work, with mom and dad. When somebody gets in a fight and there's an argument that's real tense, we do what? Squirrel! Hey, look, look at this, Jesus. The temple is really coming along great, isn't it? That Herod knows what he's doing. Jesus was having nothing to do with it. Verse 2. But he answered them, You say all these things, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Jesus wasn't having anything to do with their distraction. He wanted them to see what was happening. And at this temple right here, they think it's so great that it's going to be totally destroyed stone by stone by stone. 
Well, that sort of quenched things. The very next verse, as he sat on the Mount of Olives. So here's what happens. They come out of the temple. They go around. They go down the Kidron Valley, and they pop up on the mountain right there. And, and it's got olive trees on it. So therefore, it's called what? The Mount of Olives. Okay. Sometimes we think it's just all this super stuff. No, it's, just, it's, just, it's a mountain. It's got olives on it. They call it the Mount of Olives. They come there, and the disciples come to him privately saying. Now, we saw last week, Mark tells us who it was. It was four disciples that came. They come to Jesus privately, and they say this. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Folks, that is profound. Because Jesus had been saying something to them. Okay, we know he said the thing about the temple and the stones being turned and all that. Okay? But while they're walking along, he was talking about some other things. Because they're thinking about it. And then they come to him, these four, the ones that were really close to him. And they say, when will these things be? So they're asking two questions. The second question has two parts. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the sign of the end of the age. They were expecting a sign. Now, depending upon your background, you might have heard, well, there's signs, signs, everywhere a sign, right? Oh, y'all know that, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> too often we reject that kind of thing, that there will never be signs or anything. No, there's going to be signs. And as a matter of fact, you're going to see what it is in a minute. Are you excited? You're going to know what the sign is because the Scripture tells us what the sign is so they're asking these questions i want you to look at this because from verse 4 to verse 14 in matthew 24 jesus gives a panoramic overview of the balance of time in nine or ten verses he gives us everything what's going to happen just a gigantic overview the first thing he says in verse 4 jesus answered them see that no one lead you astray. You notice he didn't deal with uh, the time. He didn't deal with the sign. He didn't deal with the specifics of what they were saying, but he did. The first thing he said is to see to it that no one lead you astray. Now think about that for a moment. There's going to be a temptation to be led astray from whatever. I'm going to say from the truth. But see to it means you have a role and responsibility. Tony, you have a role and responsibility to see to it that no one leads you astray. Scott, you have a role and a responsibility to see to it that no one leads you astray. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. We can encourage one another. We can exhort one another. We can teach one another. We can talk. We can do all this. But we have to see to it. The very first thing that Jesus said was, see to it, that you have role, that you have responsibility, that it, you have to do something. Lovely, right? Verse 5. Here's why. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. This is the reason you have to be like this, to see to it that no one deceive you, that no one leave you astray. Because there's going to be many who will come and saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Well, we've seen that before, okay? And even today, you'll see where people will claim to be a Christ, will claim to be a Messiah, and they will lead many people astray, okay? So I think that's probably the primary understanding of this. But I think there's another understanding also that the language allows, as they say, okay? I think there are many, and in our world, probably more like this, there are many who will say that Jesus is the Christ, that will acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, and yet they're leading people astray. And yet they're leading people astray. Out of my background uh, is predominantly the concept and the idea that we don't have to worry about any of this kind of stuff because we're going to be out of here, or we're going to get beamed up, and I don't have to worry about it. And good luck with y'all. Well, isn't that just a lovely attitude of the Savior, <laughs> to think that way? And so when I first started really teaching a lot of this, maybe 20, 25 years ago, I was seeing more and more about this. And I had friends that, that they would fight with me over this. Can you imagine? People get argumentative. They get bent out of shape. And I remember telling one very, very dear friend. And I said, okay, here's, here's the bottom line. If I am wrong, 
and we don't encounter the great tribulation and we don't encounter the evil things and the Lord takes us away from that, then I will apologize to you on the way up. <laughs> Seriously, I'm sorry. But if you are incorrect, then the body of Christ is going to be completely and totally unprepared for what's coming. When Jesus said, first of all, see to it that no one leads you astray. Because you're going to have false Christ. You're going to have false teaching. Now, a lot of times the false teaching will come in the form of innocence. They're ignorant. Anybody in here ignorant? Everybody is ignorant. Yes, thank you, Mike. Raise your hand. We're all, ignorant just means you're unlearned. I'm unlearned about most things. And the things that I think I'm very learned about, I learn things about them every day. So what does that tell you? I embrace the ignorance, folks. Embrace the ignorance, okay? And so look what Jesus says here next. Verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Do we hear of wars and rumors of wars? All the time. It's been going on through history. But watch this. See to it that you're not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. The second command is see to it that you're not alarmed. See to it that you're not afraid. See to it that you're not terrified. These are all different English translations. I have a role and a responsibility. Tony, you too. Scott, you too. I'm picking on the three of us today. Okay, A role and a responsibility not to be fearful. Not to be afraid. I cannot choose to be afraid. Now, I walk in the wisdom of fear. Usually the example I think of, if I'm bebopping along and I jump a copperhead right here, the Lord's built me in such a way my body immediately starts doing the snake dance. And then I flee. That is a healthy kind of fear. But we are not to be fearful. We are not to be alarmed. We are not to be afraid. The world's trying to do that to us right now, by the way. If you don't believe it, just spend 30 minutes with any particular news broadcast you want to pick up. And just listen to the fear mongering. Oh, the chickens are dying next. Oh, the necks are dying next. Here comes the next one up. It's fear mongering and it's lies. I need to take a swig of my magic juice. Do y'all want to know what's in here? <clears throat> Peppermint tea. It enables me to talk forever. <laughs> Someone in the booth says, somebody grab that. <laughs> I, I sang three hours last night. I did a three-hour straight gig with this right here. I was able to do it. You know, it's good stuff. Don't be afraid, folks. And then this curious little phrase, which I don't understand all of it. For this must take place. It's prophesied. You see it, tons of things prophesied in the scripture about what must take place. But Jesus said these things must take place. And you know what? It's not the end yet. So even all the stuff that we've experienced in our lives and wars and rumors of wars, folks, it's only the beginning. Here's my bottom line with all this with everybody. I say, fear not, it's going to get worse. Fear not, it's going to get worse. Then verse 7. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Uh, the Greek word for nation right there is where we get our word ethnos. It's ethnos, ethnicities. In other words, you're going to have race wars. Is that happening? And it's always fomented and the evil one's trying to do things. Kingdoms against kingdom. That's nations in the sense we know them. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Well, there's always been famines. Go all the way back to the beginning of the scripture. There's always been earthquakes. What's intriguing about this and what's really struck my attention in the last 15 to 20 years is I think that most of these things are man-made. I know the famines are starting to be man-made right now. Ever try to buy a real seed? Okay. Ever try to do that? <laughs> are you ready to eat insects? Are you wondering why all of a sudden there's so many fires at food production plants? There's so many fires at chicken and meat plants and things like this? To quote Patrick Henry, I smell a rat. I'm suspicious of some things right here. I suspect some things are going on. Then eight, all these things are but the beginning of birth pangs. They're just the beginning. Now remember, Jesus is answering the question, what? When will these things occur and what's going to be the sign of your coming again and of the end of the age? This is the answer. As a matter of fact, that answer is the whole 24th and 25th chapter of Matthew. It's all red. 
all red letters. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Paul talks about that a lot, particularly in the Thessalonian letters. He says there's going to be a falling away from the faith. There's going to be a hatred. Verse 11, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. You see that phraseology several times in the scripture. It doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean that you earn your salvation by enduring to the end. What it does mean is the fact that you've been able to endure the end is the de facto proof that you're truly saved. You see the difference with that? The fact that you're truly saved. That's what Paul was talking about uh, when his writings. He says he just wanted to press on and hope that he would be able to press on to the end. He wasn't doubting his faith. He wasn't questioning himself. But he knew that that's the strongest evidence that you're actually in right relationship with the Lord. That you will endure to the end. Oh, it's verse 14. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. <laughs> that's, how, that's how Jesus ends it. He said, then the end will come. But I would encourage you to go read Matthew 24 and 25. The next verse, verse 15, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, that abomination that was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, then those who are in Judea, you need to flee to the mountains right now. We're about to see this out of Mark, but Matthew gives a little more detail with it. Uh, Jesus actually calls Daniel a prophet, which means that Daniel is what? A prophet. And you would think, well, most people think that. No, they don't. You go to Bible colleges and the seminaries, and they teach that Daniel wasn't a prophet. And I love the reason they say he wasn't a prophet, because he was too accurate. I kid you not. He was too accurate. So therefore, it must be history rather than prophecy. I will not go down that road anymore. <laughs> okay. So let me just recap this little part right here. He says, see to it that no one deceives you. See to it that you do not fear, that you're not alarmed, that you're not afraid. These things got to take place, but it's not the end. There will be ethnic problems. There's going to be national problems. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be famine. There's going to be all sorts of things. You're going to be delivered up to tribulation. We're going to see, uh, I'm not sure if I got this. Yeah, we're going to see just a moment of the verse. And Luke gives us a little insight about this, that this tribulation you're given up to, that you're going to be hauled before powers that be, whether they be religious, whether they be political, whatever it may be, it's going to be an opportunity for you to declare your witness. Let me just read it, Luke uh, 21. Settle it therefore in your mind not to meditate before how to answer when you're hauled before like that. For I will give you mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. He says you're going to be able to testify and witness. Don't be surprised. You're going to be delivered up. You'll be delivered up by your family members. Is that heartbreaking? Yes, but not surprising. I know some of y'all's family. I know my family. Okay? You will also be hated. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, let's go to Mark. Mark chapter 13. That passage right there out of Matthew 24 is the first part of Mark 13. I'm going to pick it up at Matthew, uh, I mean, uh, Mark 13, verse 14. It says this. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. We're going to learn more about this this fall, because this fall we're going to be doing a series in Daniel. And Daniel is where the abomination of desolation is spoken of, and it's what Jesus is talking about. What's interesting with Mark is that Mark defines the abomination of desolation as a he. In the other Gospels, in Daniel, you're not quite sure what it is. Is it activity? Is it something that occurs? Is it something that somebody does? But here, Mark says, he. What is a he? It's a, it's a man, it's a human being, a male human being. He says, when you see this, let those in Judea flee to the mountains, not those in New Bern. We don't have to flee to the mountains, which is a good thing, because that's not a small walk. 
Okay? Uh, where I'm from in Alabama, I, we used to talk all the time. Okay, do you flee to Buck Tussle? Yeah. Buck Tussle is a mountain right over there. Or you go to Chigger Ridge? The problem with Chigger Ridge is what? Chiggers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. But no, no, those who are in Judea, okay, flee to the mountains. Verse 15. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. This is Jesus speaking, folks. Whatever happens with this abomination of desolation, and I think I know what it is, but we're not going to get into it right now. Well, I'll get into it a little bit. It's where the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, reveals himself to be who he really is. When this happens, if you're out there in the field and you're in the back 40, and you're on one side and your cloak's hanging on the tree on the other side, you don't even have time to run over there and grab your cloak to go. If you're on top of the roof and you have to go through the house to get out, don't even stop to grab anything. Which shows me what? This is intense and it is happening quickly. He says, don't do anything with this. And obviously those who are pregnant are going to have a harder time fleeing. Look at verse 18. Pray that it may not happen in winter. Why? Because it's harder to travel in winter. I, what I love about these kind of things just to think on is God already knows what's going to happen. He's already told us what's going to occur. Uh, a lot of things are going to occur. He knows what it is. Jesus is sitting here going, pray it doesn't happen in winter. When Jesus took on the form of flesh, his creation, he set aside certain things of his total godness. He's totally God. He's totally human. He was and is. He's in the flesh now. He's got a flesh, got a body. He didn't get rid of the body. He still got it. But he chose not to know certain things when he was here on the body, with the body. And right here, he tells us he doesn't know when this is going to happen. But he's telling us to pray. Does that mean that we could have an impact as to the timing of it? Well, probably not because the Lord knows exactly when the timing is. But if we pray, it will have a tremendous impact in our response to this, to know what to do. We are in days right now, and it's ever rapidly increasing, to where whether you live or die is going to depend upon whether you know to go to the right or go to the left. If we're praying, if we're walking with him, if we're abiding in him, he will guide us and we will know. Look at verse 19. For in those days there will be such great tribulation as not been seen from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. That is important. The great tribulation is going to be greater and more evil than anything that has occurred before. So just go through your history and your mind of all the evil things that have happened. This is going to be worse. It's worse than anything that's happening right now. And it's worse than anything that's going to happen thereafter. Jesus was letting them know and answering the questions. He's letting us know. Now listen to this detail. Again, Matthew 24 tells us this plus a little more. Verse 20. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now, as you can imagine, every one of those words is parsed into just oblivion. You know, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? Here's what the bottom line means. That there's coming a time of great tribulation when the evil one, Satan himself, his wrath is going to be poured out upon Israel and upon believers. That is going to last for a period of time. No, it isn't seven years. Okay? We'll learn more about it in Daniel. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's within that seven years. I can tell you how long the maximum amount of time it can be. Let me tell you that. The maximum amount of time that it could be is 31 months. That's the maximum. I don't know how long, because I don't know when the Lord's going to come. And he doesn't tell us forthright, but he does tell us this. He tells us when it starts. And he tells us when the end of something is. And one of the things that happens in Revelation lasts five months. So if I've got 36 months and I subtract five months from it, what do I have? 31 months. But the Lord describes that as being shortened. The days are determined, but they'll be shortened for those who are believers. 
And the reason it's shortened for those who are believers is because the days are so intense that even the elect might be deceived and might turn away. Though they will not, but it's going to be that hard. Okay? Verse 21. Uh, oh, I'll tell you what shortens it. What shortens it is that the Lord comes for his church. That's given the term sometime, uh, rapture. You don't really see that term in the scripture like that. But you also don't see Trinity. But the truth is there. But the Lord comes for his church. He actually does that. And the taking away of the church is what initiates the day of the Lord. The day of God's wrath. Effectively, God is saying this. Let me get my people with me and get them out of the way and get them safe before I start dealing with this. And that's what he does. Verse 21. And if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ. Oh, look, there he is. Do not believe him. People say this all the time. The Christ is here. The Christ. Don't believe it. Just don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. So there's going to be false Christ. There's going to be false prophets. And what do they do? They actually perform signs and wonders. A sign reveals something, gives you insight, tells you something. A wonder makes you what? Wonder, exactly. How do they do that? You know, things that I thought impossible five years ago, I don't think are impossible now because of certain kinds of technology that are being revealed and things like that. See to it that no one leads you astray. Okay, see to it because these things are going to happen. Verse 23, Jesus brings forth another directive. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Whoa. Well, there you go, folks. <clears throat> be on guard. The Lord has told us all things beforehand. He's told us everything we need to know. So don't get caught up in this thing. Well, if I only knew this, if I only know that, we have what we need to know. It's just that I don't know what we have. And I'm still learning what it is that he's revealed to us. So be on the guard. Verse 24. But in those days... After the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. There's going to be things happening within the heavenly realm, within the sun, moon, and stars and the powers. Now, we're going to read some more scripture real, real quick about this in just a moment because you see it in several places in the scripture, this happening. We're sitting here thinking, well, how's, that? how's a star going to come down and fall from heaven and land here? Here's where I am now. Okay, you ready to hear where I am now? I think we have a great misunderstanding about the true nature of the sun, moon, and stars. Generally speaking, I think what I was taught and what I thought I knew is not the truth. And if I just open my eyes and see, I see greater truths that the Lord reveals. And so I'm just looking to see what the facts are right now. I just encourage you. Remember, I, we've mentioned this before. Just go all Sergeant Joe Friday on it. Just facts, ma'am. Just the facts. What does it say? There's going to be tribulation. The sun's going to be darkened. The moon won't give its light. Notice that the moon has its light. It's very important. Pay attention to these little things, right? Very important. And the stars will be falling away, and the powers in the heaven will be shaken. This is the sign, folks. Look at the next verse. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Here's what God's going to do. He's going to blow all the lights out. Everything's going to go black. I think he'll actually do it to our man-made electrical power, too. Okay? Everything will go black. Luke says this. Hey, when this happens, lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. Which means you've been doing what with your head? Sort of crouching down, but lift up your head. What's the sign? The sign is twofold. First, everything will go black. So people say, the Lord's come. I look around and go, still looks pretty what? Bright to me. Still look pretty light. And then also the fact that they will see him. Verse 27. And he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds and the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. So he's going to gather us, sun, moon, and stars go dark, then he's going to come. Now, he gives a couple of little parable kind of examples. He picks up that fig tree thing we've been looking at several times, verse 28. From the fig tree, learn his lesson. As soon as this branch becomes tender and puts out his leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things take place, you know that he is near at 
the very gates. So we don't know the day nor the hour, but we will know the season. As the fig tree right here, you know, is breaking forth. Is it, now, is he trying to nail down, say, okay, winter, spring, summer, fall? Probably not. Me personally, I'm more inclined to think he'll probably come in the fall. I could be totally wrong on that, so if I am, I'm wrong. And the only reason for that is the seven feasts of Israel. Remember those feasts of Israel we covered a few weeks back? Mind-numbing information, right? The first four feasts are spring feasts, and they were fulfilled when the Lord came the first time. The last three fall feasts are going to be fulfilled when he comes the second time. So I think there's something maybe worth paying a little bit of attention there, but I don't know, you know. So, but he presses on, verse 30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. He's not talking about the ones he's talking to right there. He's talking about the generation that experiences this right here. Okay? When, you see, when everything goes black, you can know he's coming. Okay? He's literally at the gate. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Verse 32. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So that's what I've been referring to. Jesus is saying, angels don't know. Nobody knows. I don't know. So quit acting like you know. Quit teaching. Quit preaching. Quit writing books. I have got the book. Aaron mentioned it last week. 88 reasons why the Lord is coming in 1988. I got the book. I got it in 1987. I did. It's buried somewhere in my garage, Scott, in those books. Scott helped us unload when we moved here. And do I have some boxes of books? Just a few. <laughs> it's in there. Uh, I used to have the book that came out the next year. 89 Reasons Why the Lord's Coming in 1989. Now, I'll give the guy credit. He quit after that. Seriously. Have you ever been hard-headed? Have you ever been incorrect? Have you ever been wrong? We all have. And there's tremendous grace and tremendous mercy. But why not just grab a hold of this right here? Jesus says, I don't know. Only the Father knows. There we go. But we can know sort of the season. We'll get a feel for it. We'll know some things. Okay? Might the Lord return at any minute? That's the doctrine of eminency. It sounds so official. Doctrine means ten, uh, teaching. Eminence means that there's nothing that has to happen before the Lord returns. And that's huge out of my background. It's also totally incorrect. Because there's, been a, there's a bunch of things that have to happen before the Lord returns. Several of them, most of them have. There may be one or two that hasn't. Okay? Verse 33 again, be on guard. If the Lord tells us to do something twice, what do you think about it? Do it. Be on guard. But here's my favorite one. It's a perfect time for our gathering right now. Keep awake. Keep awake. Stay awake. He's going to say this, I think, four times to them. Stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. The next chapter, they're going to be falling asleep while he's praying. I don't think he was talking about that right here, but I do make that observation. Okay, Be awake, keep awake, for you do not know the time, uh, when the time will come. So that's the answer. When will these things happen, Lord? You won't know the time. But keep awake. Be on guard. It's like a man going on the journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, that would be us, stay awake. Okay? Stay aware. Okay? Don't fall off into slumber. Now, I'm going to read four separate portions of Scripture here real, real quick. It just gives us a bigger picture and hopefully sort of whets our appetite to understand the Lord's given us a lot of information. We need to know this. Do not fear. He didn't give us this to fear. Okay? He gave us this because we need to know it. Back in Matthew 24, down in verse 29, it says this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. Again, the moon gives its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the earth will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. They ask for what? What's going to be the sign of your coming? And he says, oh, when you see everything turn black and you look up and you see me, that's the sign. Here's your sign. All right? 
And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. Notice the tribes of the earth are mourning. 31. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds four winds from one end of the heaven to the other now luke 21 verse 25 and there will be signs and sun and moon and stars they ask for what signs now and with luke's account of it he's saying the sun moon and stars are going to have some signs what's the sign the sun's going to go dark the moon will not give us light the stars will fall to the earth if the stars start falling to the earth do you think that might grab your attention yeah, you would hope so. You would hope so. But watch this. And on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. Luke's the only one that mentions this. That these uh, people on the earth, they're going to be distressed. The nations is always a picture of unbelievers. They're going to be distressed because of what's happening with the seas and the waves. 26. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. 27. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up. Raise your hands because your redemption is drawing near. If you have to straighten up, that tells me you've been what? Laying low. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. If somebody wants to take your head off, lower it a little bit. Okay? Then, are you ready for this? The last two passages. Revelation. Everybody do this. <sighs> Revelation chapter 6. This is the opening of the seals of a document. Okay? And the Lord Jesus Christ is opening it. It's been sealed with seven seals. It's about to be totally open. Sixth seal here, verse 12. When he, that's Jesus, opened the sixth seal... I, that's John, looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth, and the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken, uh, as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Does this sound familiar? Same thing we've been reading, right? Verse 15, then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? The great wrath of God, the great day of the Lord has come. Those that are on the earth see this, they know this. Now, what happens is, Revelation 7 is the next chapter, and there's a little parenthesis that happens. First part of the chapter, there's 144,000 Jews that are sealed. And then the next thing you see, you see in uh, verse 9 of Revelation 7. After that, John says, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from every tribe and peoples and language. Stand and bless you. Stand before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So John looks and he sees this innumerable group of people. And he's going, wait, wait, what, what is this? Verse 11. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and honor and thanksgiving and honor and power. It might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Now, 13. Then one of the elders addressed me. So one of the elders comes up to John and says, Hey, who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? And he said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. 
it shows us when the Lord's coming to uh, grab his people, to snatch his people, to fetch his people. There will be some that are still alive during that tribulation time. There will be others of us who have already died, are out with the Lord, and now our bodies will be joined with our spirit, I guess. That's what's happening right here. We're seeing a picture of it. So what does this all mean? So hang with me here one more minute. Folks, we need to learn what the, what the Word says. We need to learn what the Word of God says. We also need to learn what the Word says, the Lord Jesus Christ, what He said about these matters. We need to learn the facts. So much has been given to us, and He wants to teach us, and He wants to show us. We need to be very Berean. Okay, Berean. Remember the Bereans? Uh, Paul came to them and brought the gospel to them, and they went and searched out the Scripture to, to determine if what he said was true. We need to be like that, particularly when we hear and read other teachings, other writings. You know, don't, don't have an attitude, oh, this guy's wrong with this and that. No, you know, he may be wrong, but have the right attitude about it, you know. But be very, very aware. So here's the bottom line. Fear not. Fear not. This is grammatically incorrect. Faith much. Fear not. Faith much. See to it that no one deceives you. See to it that you do not fear. Be on your guard. Do not be anxious about what you're going to say. As a matter of fact, Jesus' greater teaching in the Sermon on the Mount is don't be anxious for anything. Okay, don't be anxious for anything. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. Stay awake. These things must take place, but it's not the end. Okay, band, come on up here, guys. There will be ethnic problems. There will be kingdom national problems. There are going to be earthquakes. There are going to be famine. I think that a lot of them are man-made again. You're going to be delivered over political and religious powers, okay? But don't worry about it. You're going to have an opportunity to bear witness of the kingdom. And then the gospel is going to be proclaimed first, and then the Lord is going to come. You're going to be delivered over for trial, delivered over by family members. You're going to be hated. Lovely, right? But the one who endures to the end will be saved, okay? So do this, guys. Settle it like Luke says. Settle it in your mind. Like I said, deal with that cognitive dissonance. What that means is your mind is, can't wrap your mind around what the Scripture is saying because you've been told something else. Go with what the Scripture says. Fear not, guys. Rejoice. We're going to do this right now. Worship. Understand this that you are here by the hand of the Most High God for such a time as this. As we gather around the table, thank the Lord for what He did for us, for His blood, for His body, and then say this to Him. <laughs> Lord, help. Help me understand. Show me the truth. What are you desiring for me to do? But really, really, really just pour forth. We're going to sing it right now. Pour forth your gratitude to him, the Lord and the Most High God, because that is how we will walk through these days. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you for your scripture. Lord, I thank you for uh, this really long, detailed answer to the short questions. Lord, may we know these truths, and may we realize that you have placed us here for such a time as this, to your praise, to your honor, and your glory. We love you.
Except for all singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Now I've got one response. Now I've got just. truth that you are with us. Just help us to have a heart of gratitude. Just be with us as we leave here and protect us as we go. Just help us have a good vacation this week. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>